right. Hello, and thank you for coming to tonight's program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I am Femily, and I'm a gender inclusion advisor and new member of the Inforum board, as they told you before. I'm super delighted to be with all of you tonight. We will be discussing one of my favorite pieces of research, McKinsey and & Company and Lean In's annual Women in the Workplace report. What this report, year, this report tells us how women are doing in the workplace this year and for the previous five years, and it gives us bright spots and areas to focus on for the future. Here with us tonight is Alexis Krivkovich, senior partner of McKinsey and Company Silicon Valley office and managing partner of the San Francisco office, and more importantly, co-founder of the report. And also Tara Lyons, former policy advisor in President Barack Obama's Office of Science and Technology <laughs> Policy and founding executive director of the Partnership on AI, a premier nonprofit focusing on AI policy and tech governance. So again, if you have questions, we're going to do questions via index card. So grab that index card and make sure to fill it out. We'll be collecting those throughout the program. Okay. So, Alexis, the biggest, most comprehensive report on women in the workplace has just come out in partnership with Lean In. It's now in its fifth year. What are you seeing? Can you give us the context here that we need to sort of foreground this conversation of like, what is it showing us? What's surprising? What does data help us understand that gut impulse alone doesn't doesn't do. All right, seven questions. Let me go. <laughs> um, so let me start with the context about why we even undertook this exercise. Um, and it started a number of years ago because there were uh, many of us uh, within McKinsey who were finding that we felt like a lot of the conversation about such an important topic on talent was happening by anecdote. It was like, well, I heard this. Well, I remember a story about that. And it felt like that is not the way we solve any other tough problem out there. Like you wouldn't say our costs are through the roof. Well, I feel like it might be this, right? <laughs> <laughs> You'd say, go get me some data and let's break it down and figure it out. And we felt like for such an important question, which is about the future of talent and harnessing all of the talent, men, women, racial talent, people with disabilities, sexual orientation, background and characteristic, that we weren't talking about that important issue in the right way, and we just weren't doing it with data. So what we did was we set out to basically solve that. And so five years ago, we said in combination with McKinsey and Lean In, let's build the largest data set so we at least know what's going on and we can break it down mm -hmm. to the issues. And over five years, we now today in this year's report had 329 companies. They represent over 13 million employees. Any given year, we have almost 70,000 people individually share their experiences. And we survey dozens of people deeply about what they're seeing in the workplace environment. And that's the process of the data that we've built. And I think what it tells is a story that a lot of us um, deep down felt that led to the frustration that was the impetus for this, which is, it's 2019. I mean, come on. And we don't have the environment we don't want to see. I don't walk into workplace rooms that have this degree of diversity mm -hmm. in them, right? And that's actually something we want to see more and more of um, in the environment, and it's why we kicked this all off. Mm. Awesome. So Tara, from your perspective, some would say you're deep in the heart of bro culture in terms of <laughs> <laughs> your topic. Lucky you. <laughs> in terms of your area and your field and your industry. So what, um, what are you seeing in terms of gender in that, in that space? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I mean, I guess by bro culture, I mean deep in the heart of Silicon Valley. Sure. <laughs> with which that is, uh, you know, synonymous in some circumstances. I think in the AI field specifically, it is particularly mm -hmm. so. Um, I mean, you know, there's plenty of statistics to cite in the awesome report um, that Alexis just talked about. But in the tech industry in general, they're even more dismal than they are in the workforce right. writ large. So, you know, like in technical workforces, when you drill down a layer deeper, tw it hovers around 20% workforce participation for females in tech companies surrounding us in the area. Um, and when you go to AI and machine learning, that number is even lower. It's closer to 10 to 15%, depending mm -hmm. on the company. 
Um, and it's not much better in academia, to be honest. I mean, you know, senior faculty members in computer science departments do not necessarily reflect the talent in their lecture rooms, and, and they should. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's, it's a big problem, and it reflects in real ways on the technology that is being developed by the teams in these companies uh, and, you know, in, in decision-making rooms all over the world. Um, so I think a lot of the challenges that we've seen become a through line in the public narrative around, you know, what is most wrong with tech culture right now, in part are actually generated by that disparity. Right. Yeah, and you're talking about diversity in terms of percentages of women who are in the room. You're talking about impact in terms of honor society. And then it also makes me think about in the report, uh, the inclusion aspect, the feeling and the experience for those women who are in the, as you mentioned, 15% or whatever, if they're in such small representation, then they're often these onlys in the room. Can you mention a little bit about what the experience is of onlys? Yeah, so this was one of the biggest findings actually from last year's report was We'd spend a lot of time looking at the data on the pipeline, and we should talk about kind of the state of where we're at mm -hmm. on that. But we really wanted to understand the cultural experience. Like, what does it feel like then to be underrepresented in any form? And what we found was there's very real implications of that. So 20% of women um, will say they often have an experience in the workplace where they're the only, where they have to represent the entirety of 50% of the human population by gender. And that number is double if you're a woman of color. That number is double if you're in tech. It's double if you're a senior leader. And the, the importance of that is that it's closely correlated with saying, I've experienced a lot of microaggressions. Mm -hmm. And microaggressions are what I think of as typically unintended but frequent moments that happen across your, your workday that undermine the sense that you have a reason to be there. Mm -hmm. There are things like needing to qualify yourself and why you have expertise to be in the room, being mistaken for someone younger, being asked to go do administrative tasks when you're actually there to present the numbers, mm -hmm. right? People questioning your background and your knowledge and your understanding. All of these things that lead people to have moments that just f make them feel less. And they happen to everybody, but they happen far more often when you are the only. And it's a really important issue for us to recognize that the data shows is real mm -hmm. because it's very difficult when you're in that situation to try and feel like your comments are scrutinized, not just for what you have to say, but for everybody you represent. So, you know, women of color will say, I'll say something and people are like, oh, she's probably saying it because she's supportive because she's a black woman. Oh no, she's saying it because she's not supportive. Mm -hmm. Look at that, because she's a black woman. Wait, because she's, you know, woman of color, because she's a woman, you know, and they're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Just, <laughs> like nobody said anything about John's comments over there. Mm -hmm. And they feel this sense of this weight associated with what they're doing that makes it that much more difficult to feel like you have a path to really achieve. Mm. Yeah, and so, when we think about, so your report, the report is considered a sort of state of women in the workplace, right? So people turn to it to ask questions that they're feeling in their hearts of like, it's not really going that well <laughs> to get the data to back it up. So are there some stunning facts from this year that are, that can really galvanize leaders to see the truth? Yeah. I, so let me start with the bright spot because yeah. we should say um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot to work on, but there, um, there are some, some places to focus because I think we really need to grab onto the stuff that is working and say, how do we bring more of that in? The bright spot is over the past five years, we've seen the number of women in the C-suite increase by 24%. Mm. That's big. Almost half of companies now in corporate America have three or more women in their C-suite. And that's important because there is something about a tipping point, and you can't ask one individual, the only in the room, to solve it all. But when you have a few, you start to have momentum. And so that's the really positive story. And it suggests to me, knowing C-suite roles are highly scrutinized, they're you know, really big bets, these are extremely large mandates of responsibility, that this can be done. Mm -hmm. The flip side, and probably the most stunning thing in my mind, five years into looking at this research, is how far we have to go at the very beginning of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So in the corporate pipeline today, we start out with almost parity, not quite, but women to men, 48% to 52. But by first manager position, those women have dropped to 38%. And the reason why is the very first promotion in this country is the most inequitable. For every 100 men who leap forward, only 72 women do. 
And for women of color, it's even worse. For black women, that number's 58. That alone, that disparity alone, sets up an entire pipeline we can't recover from. And just to put it in context, if you fix that one disparity of the 100 to 72, over the next five years, you'd add a million more women to management. One thing that I think is really notable about the first statistic that Alexis noted was that in the, C, the C, C-suite leap or whatever we want to call it, um, there's, there's actually a concept in gender theory called the critical mass theory, which mm. essentially stipulates that roughly, like if, there are, if there's one woman in a room, the sort of othering effect that you mentioned really comes into play. It's an extremely strong dynamic. If there's another woman in the room or another person of a similar race, for example, then th- the dynamic is diminished. And when you have three in 10 people in a room yeah. of the same gender, then they finally, that's the, the, essentially the scientifically noted tipping point for them no longer feeling like an other. So I think that th- it's a really good sign that we've gotten there. There's obviously a long way to go, but I think that's really awesome. And another thing that I thought was really surprising actually in this year's findings was that um, there's a huge difference, it seems, in, in companies' public commitments to gender diversity and perception of those commitments by employee bases. Um, and I think if I'm remembering this correctly, please fact check me, but I think the difference was 86% public commitment um, across companies and roughly 56% of employees or maybe less than that really felt like there was true action behind those words. So I think that's another, it's, a, it's maybe a call to action for all of us to think about and especially for institutions mm-hmm. in remarking on um, in what was found this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me wonder, so what would those actions be, right? So the company website's like, we're all about gender equity here, right? Like most company websites would be saying, especially in California. So like, what would a company do if they were experiencing uh, the broken rung at the early part of the career ladder for women? What's a concrete step that our company leaders in the audience can take forward. Yeah, I I mean, I think the good news with having progress at the top is that there are actually examples of things that are working and we can see them in the data. Mm -hmm. The big step if companies need to actually take that playbook and apply it to the very beginning of their pipeline. I mean, just as you said, it's like, I'm I'm making the public commitment. Now let's back those words up with action. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's in some ways it's easier. It's a complex problem at the top, given the nature of those roles. And if you don't have a deep pipeline to draw from, but it's a law of very small numbers that you're solving for. The challenge companies face at the front end is that we're talking about really large populations. But the exciting part is if you change some of that, you can move the needle really quickly. So the types of things that they're using at the top that they need to apply more directly right at the start is You know, do you have objective criteria for how you evaluate who deserves a promotion? This seems like an obvious thing, Mm -hmm. but over half of employees will say, I do not see objective criteria being used in evaluations. Do you train all of your evaluators, not just the most senior ones, Mm -hmm. but with unconscious bias training? Do you have techniques using data to actually spot check afterwards that the outcomes that you're getting are statistically balanced and what you would expect, right? There are these sets of actions. They're actually really concrete. There's just, you know, a lack of discipline, frankly, Mm -hmm. to take those concepts and just rigorously apply them at the very start. But I'm confident, given what we've seen over the past five years at the top, that there's absolutely the room to do that. Mm -hmm. And frankly, given the talent environment we're in and the competitiveness of that, the companies that do are going to be out in front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like the spotlight was really shined on the glass ceiling and a lot of attention was paid there. And now that the lean in report has termed it as the broken rung, there can be the spotlight shining there and backed up with all of the the steps that are backed up by data. I feel hopeful about that too. Do you think, let's zoom in. I'm sure there are a lot of folks in the audience who are specifically in the tech world. So are there, um, are there insights from this, the past five years and certainly from you, Tara? Are there, are there things to be said about women in tech specifically as it relates to either early wrong or all the way up to the glass ceiling, which we know that hasn't been cured yet either for women in tech? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, you know, I think that another sort of intervention that was mentioned in the report and is proven in a number of other different fora include 
setting hiring benchmarks and actually, mm. you know, hiring against basically using diverse slates, um, which is a tactic long proven to be effective, not often utilized, surprisingly, by tech companies, large or small. So I think that starting there is a really good thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't improve what you can't, what you're not measuring, as they right. say. Um, and so I think another really important thing is, um, is public transparency around diversity t statistics. And I think that really helps, you know, with an accountability mechanism for tech companies to uh, really incite a race to the top dynamic, which is what the tech industry really needs right now, especially in technical roles for, mm -hmm. for women and underrepresented minorities. Um, and, and so I think that's another useful intervention. And just, you know, I, you know at the C-suite level, especially making sure that you have visible women in senior technical leadership as well is really important in the, um, in the realm in which I work at least, because in AI, um, you know, to use another trope, I'm just dropping them all over the place. You can't <laughs> be what you can't see, as they say, right? And so, um, and this is a big problem in the classroom as well, where women enter a lecture hall and for eight semesters, you know, they go through a computer science curriculum and don't have a single female lecturer in front of them. So I think that that, um, that visibility of, of female leadership and promoting them into those positions so that they can then turn around and sponsor other women and women are inspired to, they really understand and can internalize that they can get there is really important too. Yeah, I, I love that. And I and what I would add there is in environments where you, the imbalance is more extreme today, mm -hmm. it requires even more from male leaders to step in and fill that void. Because one of the other phenomenon we see is that you end up with these onlys, with this very small number of individuals yeah. who are being asked to carry the weight and represent and pull up like a much, much larger community underneath them. And there's just, there's literally the math doesn't work to allow that to happen. And when I spend time with senior female leaders, one of the things they spend a lot of time actually expressing is I feel stress and fear that I just, I cannot do enough. Like there's not enough of me to go around. I cannot create enough opportunity. I cannot be the visible person yeah. everywhere I need to be. And I know how important it is and I know how important it was for me, but there's just, there's just not enough. And it, it's really the reason that I think for this discussion, it has to be something that is framed around talent. It has to be something that's framed around inclusion. And it has to be something that has men equally at the table in leadership because they are best positioned in greater numbers to really help make that happen. And often that, I think exactly what you're referring to is, it's such an important thing to call out. It's often extremely invisible labor that women are asked to do to support other women in the workplace. And I think that's especially true in the tech industry where the burden is outsized potentially in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, things that organizations can do include like you know, making sure that in performance review cycles, you actually note people who are working on talent development as a category of leadership development and reward related to performance development and have senior managers make sure that they trickle through the entire organization recognition and reward for that type of behavior because otherwise it can just go unnoticed and under incentivized and can be really demoralizing for people who uh, have a full-time job to do on top of that. And, um, and, and want to be there to help, but just have such a high volume of requests that it's, it's really hard to do that. Yeah. Not to mention, probably, if they share a home, a double amount mm -hmm. of, home, of work on the home front that they also have to do. Have you, do you, does your report think about um, splitting the home responsibilities, or have you th do you think about that also? It, yeah, well, I mean, the data is really interesting, right? Because we have more dual career households than ever before, like in the millennial generation, and I think this will persist and continue. We have more people describing a complexity of environment where you have two people going for it um, at the same time. What's fascinating, though, is that when you look at the top, what the data shows is that over 80% of women in senior roles are in a dual career house. Mm -hmm but only about 50% of men. And then when you ask, well, who handles the household responsibilities? Women in senior roles are three times more likely than men in senior roles to say, oh yeah, I still do that part too. <laughs> right? Which is why they also say, you know what I mostly need? I really need some more workplace flexibility because <laughs> it's a really complicated equation. But I actually think for a lot of companies, part of what they're gonna need to solve 
over the next decade is how do we reimagine some of these roles for any leader who does not envision you know, the household environment of, you know, the Mad Men era. Like, right. how do we actually picture something where, you know, regardless of who you are and what your setup is, you have the ability to really deliver at work, but the ability to also be really present other places in your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, remote rem remote work is really crucial here, I think. And thankfully, more companies are getting a lot better at that. But um and thankfully, AV technology has enabled that further as well. <laughs> Although, you shouldn't ask us about how long it takes us to get our conference calls up and running sometimes. <laughs> That's great. So I'm looking through at your questions. There are quite a few here about sponsorship or mentorship of women. Is that something that is useful? How should someone go about it? What's the right approach? What is not the right approach? Yeah, so um, I'll share a few of the facts and you should share some of your experiences. Um, I can do the same. But what we see in the data is um, sponsorship is cited as one of the most important factors for helping people feel connected and like they have opportunities to advance. Um, the good news is that's on the rise in organizations over the past five years. And the gap for men and women is closing, meaning we used to see a lot more sponsorship support that men describe for themselves and women, and we've seen that closing. The challenge is only about a third of employees in general say they feel like they have a, a sponsor, right? And that number is even lower if you have elements of intersectionality, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a woman of color, a woman with disability, a uh, woman bisexual, transgender, et cetera. And so we really don't see just overall the degree of sponsorship we need. And what I find in organizations when I'm working with them on this is that um, there are two big things going on. So first of all, people are really confusing sponsorship with mentorship. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to separate the two because mentorship is like free advice. It may be good, it may be bad. You probably get a ton <laughs> of it. Sometimes you're like, ah, that was a terrible <laughs> thought. I'm not doing that. But you know, it's just like as many hours as you have in the day for a cup of coffee, you can offer up mentorship to somebody if you choose. Sponsorship is finite when it's done well. It is about actively getting to know someone, their case, their situation, taking a personal responsibility for them over time and using your position of power, access, network, opportunity to open doors, counsel, push them forward um, with you. And you cannot do that well for lots and lots of people. And so the first thing that actually a lot of companies get wrong is they kind of mush all that together, sometimes also with networking. And then it's like, yeah, I think we're kind of doing it. And then people are like, only a third of people feel like they, they get it going on. And then the second thing is they think it always has to be this organic, beautiful, you know, we met our eyes, you know, locked <laughs> in the hallway and suddenly we knew you would sponsor me and I would be your, you know. No. And like, it just like the problem with that is, you know, wh what we know from the data is that women have networks that are more full of women, men have networks that are more full of men. This is also true across other factors of diversity, kind of there's this orientation in general, kind of like to like. And if you have a pipeline where the C-suite is, you know, eight out of every 10 is a man, one of those networks is more powerful and valuable to you over time. Mm -hmm. And so if you just leave it all to happenstance, what you get is an environment where, a lot of times women, in particular women of color, they don't get the access they need to true sponsorship. And so I'm a firm believer that you can engineer it, that you can seek it out, and that you can create those connections. I think all that is, that's super interesting actually to reflect on the fact that sponsorship and mentorship so often get conflated. I think that's really important. Um, and I totally agree that you can create sponsorship programs, just like you can create mentorship programs to match people and have that relationship be explicit so that you're not relying on the magic hallway connection that you talk about, which so <laughs> rarely happens organically, I think. Um, and it, incent you know, it, again, it makes it more visible and concrete that it's a part of just what we do as an organization and it's expected of you um, to participate in if you're at a certain level and that includes people of all genders and races mm. um, being contributive to, to other folks who are more junior. So I think that's really important too. I guess the only other reflection to add from an anecdotal perspective is just that I don't. I would definitely not be where I am today without effective sponsorship. Mm -hmm. I can say that with 100% mm -hmm. confidence. And so I, I think it is so critically important. It's one of the most important things. And I also think it can happen extra organizationally as well. True. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. You know, finding somebody, even if they're outside of your company, 
setting specifically, who you trust and who believes in you and who you know can still impact your career effectively, mm -hmm. I think is also a pretty decent way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the most tactical piece of advice I give people is, you know, when companies think about assembling a board, they, um, they need to do a lot more to think about diversity, but they generally <laughs> do think about, you know, different skill sets and people they want to advise on different topics differentially. So they cover the full spectrum. And you should think that way about your own, over time, your own board of directors. And you should actually think about writing down who's the person who gives me honest feedback when I really need to hear the tough stuff. Who's the one I can turn to in confidence and get advice on a tricky situation? Who's someone who could actually help push me forward in my organization? And if I don't have that person, who might be that kind of a person over time? And actually spend time laying out that picture and thinking about how do I actually fill out this board to be more my mm -hmm. board of directors to help mm -hmm. me advance over time? And they don't all need to play the mm -hmm. same role. They don't all need to be in your company. But over time like actually not leaving it all to chance and being a bit more systematic about your part and where you have the opportunity to do that for other people, really thinking about who are the people I'd write down that I'd say today I'm sitting on their board. Right. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. Who are you today mentoring and sponsoring rising stars in your world? And what, what does that look like? How did they get you to agree to, I mean, you're both extremely busy. Like how did someone get you to agree to become their advisor, their mentor, their sponsor? Yeah, it's so, I mean, I feel that stress of so many, um, in particular, so many women, but so many people that you want to support right. and, um, and how you really do that in, in a meaningful way. Right. I do think over time, um, like substantive connection on something makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard to meet someone in a glancing moment and then say, I'd love for you to be my sponsor. And then be like, oh great, I was just wondering what to do with all my free time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for feeling that <laughs> for me. Um, I think over time you actually need to find something to really connect on. And so I find for myself, you know, the, the easier situations are when people come to me and say, I really, I know you're interested in X, I'm interested in that too. If you're ever doing things around that topic and you want someone to engage with you on it, like think of me. And then I'm like, oh, okay, because I do have things that come up and like we could go do that together mm -hmm. and then we could get to know each other right? and we could build a connection. Mm -hmm. And I'd argue the, um, uh, I think we, I think in particular for women, we have to be really comfortable making that, being that forward right. and trying to make that connection. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we I totally agree. Yeah. I think um, another, another reflection from my personal circumstance is that I've often made really strong sponsorship or mentorship connections with individuals who have pushed me actually in an upward direction. So I, I, and maybe it's my particular management and leadership style, but I just, I find that, you know, being open and my age as well, frankly, actually, um, and career stage, I think that, uh, it, I have found it really useful to engage with people who, um, you know, can challenge me actually in the way that I'm working in my organization and in my work life as well. And, um, and we can make each other better for the relationship in a sort of mutual sense too. Um, but yeah, I would say, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think you're right in that nobody is, is probably looking to add to their plate. <laughs> um, but I do think I, I would advocate for being unafraid of actually proactively approaching people and asking because it doesn't hurt to ask. And I think the connection point that you mentioned um, being, you know, an interest um, that you both share is a really strong way to do it. Mm -hmm. That makes me think about uh, this notion that's really juicy in the world of women's leadership, which is feedback. I know there's some interesting stuff I in the sure report. Where you're going with that. <laughs> I know there's some interesting stuff in the report about women and feedback and the gender binary and how it works for men in the workplace and women in the workplace. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is interesting. We looked at this first... Um, years ago in the first year we were doing the research and um, because we had a hunch that there were some differences that were hard to quantify. And what's interesting is when you ask managers, um, do you give feedback equally to men and women, male and female managers, they'll say, yes, absolutely. Yes, I do the same. And then when you start asking about different types of feedback, what you find is you say, okay, well, how about positive feedback? Oh, yes. How about really tough feedback? And both men and women will say, when it comes to giving hard-hitting messages, mm -hmm. when I have to deliver them to a woman, I'm less likely to do so. Yeah. 
I kind of punt on it. Mm -hmm. And we see this in other research because we, you know, women will describe the same situation will happen, right? And a man will be, you know, a young man will be pulled aside and said, hey, that meeting didn't go well. You weren't on top of your numbers. You weren't buttoned up. People expect more than that. You've got a lot of potential, but you got to really, you got to really change that if you think you're going to have a real future here. A woman gets pulled aside. Hey, that didn't go very well. You know, you really need to tighten your communication. I think your message maybe got lost. Think about how you tell the story about what you're trying to do. And, you know, and that's just going to, it's just one of those skills you're going to have to build. Right. And the woman walks away and goes, oh, I've got to work on my communication. Right. And the guy walks away and goes, I got to like nail my numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. And they have very <laughs> different ideas of what needs to happen next. And I think what's important behind that is if you don't have someone telling you that the honest truth, giving yeah. you hard messaging, you might actually think you're doing all the right things. And we hear this, I feel like I'm hitting all of the marks and then I'm not getting vaulted forward. Right. And some of that is certainly bias still in the system that we have to root out. But some of it is actually the feedback mechanism is quite broken. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of that is the degree to which we then default to very gendered feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number of women who've heard, like, they need more gravitas. Like, I've never seen a male review no. that said, like, this man needs some gravitas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just like, it does not Speak exist. Speak from your diaphragm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> does not exist. Yeah. And what's fascinating is when we then took data on, have you ever heard in your performance review that um, you are um, bossy, aggressive, um, sharp elbowed, etc. Like women were so much more likely mm -hmm. to say that they experienced seeing those words pop up. And if they'd ever advocated for themselves for a promotion, a raise, you know, a next advancement, that number went up dramatically. Right. And it doesn't for men. And so it's like, I want you to lean forward. I want you to push for yourself. Go find those people. Right? Oh, but when you do, I don't like it so much. Could you work on the gravitas instead? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think actually feedback about feedback, meta feedback is really important oh. here. And in a management relationship, actually talking about how you want to be talked to mm -hmm. from your by your manager, I think can help open the door to alleviate a little bit of that dynamic. But I agree, it's a really challenging one. I've suffered from personally myself. And um and yeah, it's it's on the organ it's really not your fault. It's on the organization to fix that problem, right? So and it's on the managers um, to deliver feedback more effectively. So I think that you have every right to expect that from the people that you work with. And it's something that everyone needs to work on more. And I'm hearing you also say from the agency side of it, that if you're not getting it, yeah. that what you can say, you can coach the person giving you feedback, which is like, thank you for telling me about my dress and my demeanor. Also, was there anything performative, right? What, what's the way that you define it, Alexis, in the report of like, uh, you want to ask for feedback that's more constructive than about your hair and your dress and your voice? Well, I mean, I tell people to ask about, you know, my business performance. Yeah. Business and and literally ask what, like, what, what do you think, if you feel like you get a review that's either flat or bland or generic or gendered or just frankly not helpful to you, just say, you know, what are some things I can work on on my business performance? Mm -hmm. I aspire to get to where you are. What would be one of the skills I need to develop to get there? And then people will be like, oh, well, you want to be me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> First thing you can, and they're not going to say, like, put on a dress, yeah. right? They're going to give right. you something substantive and concrete. And so I think, I think it's a great point about how you can actually train or sort of pull the feedback out. Because very often it's that there's this nervousness that it won't go well. It's not that I don't have anything to share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's often at the relationship level where this breakdown happens, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's people being nervous around other people and feedback's hard to give yeah. effectively to begin with. But, um, with the gender dynamic involved, it's especially challenging. So just being upfront about it, I think can actually help. Yeah. All right. Speaking of the gender dynamic, let's get intersectional. So the report is <laughs> one of the first, I mean, it's certainly the biggest and most comprehensive, but one of the reasons it's the most comprehensive is because it also looks at women with disabilities, women of different races, and women of different orientations, and gives us really meaty feedback and data about what's going on for those different groups. So if you could tell us a little bit more about um, 
uh, what the report is saying from an inter from a few intersectional perspectives. Yeah. 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 So the first the first big piece is looking at the question of where are we on the talent pipeline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked already about the picture for women in general, which is we start at near parity, 48%. By the time we get to the C-suite, we're down to one in five. And interestingly, it, regardless of industry where you start, you might start with 60%, 50%. In tech, it's much lower, you know, 35%. There's this, like, regression to the substandard mean where we're all, like, sitting somewhere around one to five by the time we get to the top. Um, for women of color... It's far worse. So we start out with 18%, and by the time we get to the C-suite, we're talking 4%. Mm -hmm. I mean, one in 25. It's, it's virtually not represented, certainly in the way that represents this country and the mm -hmm. diversity that we have. And so we have an extremely bleak and far more challenging issue where the success that's actually happening in the C-suite on gender is not happening by race mm -hmm. um, and the situation is more profound in terms of then being the only experiencing microaggressions all of these other factors you know women of color are not a monolithic group there are a lot of different experiences in there um, in particular it's uh, Latina women and black women who mm -hmm. experience the most significant uh, differences and the ways this shows up is in some of the really important basics that we know are correlated with the sense of fairness and opportunity in the workplace. So this is things like managers that give me feedback, that have my back, that coach me, that help me navigate politics. Mm -hmm. You know, people who give me a sense that I have a path forward here. Mm -hmm. And it's more muted, but similarly true for um, lesbian women. Um, and it's particularly bad for women with disabilities who say, I, I feel like I'm both hyper visible and also invisible at the same time. Right which is super important for getting uh, those accomplishments that are visible enough to give you the promotion. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons if we take a lot of the systematizing elements, like the playbook from the top and apply it more directly to the early stage, mm -hmm. like it's really hard to pinpoint the issues when you don't have standard criteria, mm -hmm. criteria to evaluate people. Yeah. Like it's very hard to go back and say, I think I was checking all those boxes when you're mm -hmm. like boxes. Yeah. What boxes? Right. And so you really need to make that stuff transparent. You need to look at the, I'm a big believer. If you look at the data, like you should see a scatter plot and whether you plot it by gender, by race, by disability or anything else, you should see no difference in how your populations split when it comes to performance ratings. Yeah. And if you see correlations, they're sure you've got a big problem there. And there are a lot of companies that don't even do that basic look mm -hmm. at their own data. Mm -hmm. For sure. I'm getting a couple other questions in here that are about, um, that are similarly on this topic. Does, um, do either of you have data or experiential stuff about ageism or aging in the, in companies and a bunch in here are also about parenting? So, about working women and maternity leave and if those have an effect on um, someone's career trajectory and what someone can do to um, outsmart that kind of bias. Do you want to say, I'm the older one, should I start? <laughs> do you want to take ageism? <laughs> um, I, I think it's a big issue, particularly in the Valley. This comes up all the time. Um, we, it, it's interesting. So we don't see as many differences generationally as I would expect. And I think that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Like on one level it says, okay, these are somewhat universal experiences that are happening. If we can solve them once, we can kind of solve them for everyone. Um, the reason it's a bad thing is like, I want to see like a groundswell of change coming. And I remember <laughs> five years ago being on a stage at a conference and having a, uh, a renowned, much older investor um, in uh, private equity say to me, like, don't bother solving this problem. It's a generational issue. It's fixing itself. Right. And I was like, oh my God, if that were only true, I could go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's, the, the, you know, that's one of the, the real challenges. I think the reason the ageism point is so acute for women is because when this first promotion is really inequitable, it takes you longer. Every step takes you longer. There are more headwinds. They are real. They are not made up in your mind. And because it takes longer, you start to feel like you don't have time mm -hmm. and you're not building the access to keep going. And so a lot of women really settle in much earlier in the pipeline than they should. And then they feel like they, they're kind of missing 
missing their moment and their opportunity. And I think on the parenting point, it's, it's exacerbated by, and then if you're also going in and out on leaves, you know, you're creating even more moments of discontinuity that, that in most workplaces you are left to overcome on your own. Yeah. It's like, congratulations, maybe you're lucky enough in this country, not everyone is, to get paid maternity leave. But you are expected to figure out how at nine months pregnant you waddle still into the office and then the day you come back with a newborn, it's like spit up on your shoulder, how you just like crank it out, you know, and people are like, oh, you're back, here you go, right? And we're not really very good at figuring out, you know, you were gone because something big just happened. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it wasn't like getting your hair done, like it's right. going to be, going to be with you for a while. Right? Uh, <laughs> I wish my hair days lasted that long. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, what else to say? The U.S. is the only yeah. country in its development tier without man nationally mandated paid family leave, right? So it's it's like, this is a big issue for us, and I um, I, I think it it has a big impact on the way that cr career trajectories unfold for women, especially. Yeah. Um, but it also has an impact on a lot of the other dynamics that we've been discussing, like what. Split, you know what dual income houses look like split across work life balance and what um, you know what pay, equal pay looks like before and after mm -hmm. um, families have children and so it's yeah I think it's a it's a huge issue um, I, I don't know what more to say on ageism to be honest I wish I had some data at my fingertips but I I, I do think that's an issue too and especially in the tech industry you know there's uh, I, you know there's this is, again, not necessarily a data-driven analysis, but there's a perception challenge with the sort of, um, the, you know, the godlike founder complex that instills a certain kind of attitude that trickles all the way down from the uh, executive suite um, into the rest of the company. And that can incite all sorts of things related to toxic workplace culture and also related to gender dynamics as well. So true. There was a uh, ageism panel here at the Commonwealth Club a few months ago. Google it on the Commonwealth Club's website for the podcast. It was awesome. The one thing that they were talking about was menopause leave for women who are reaching that age. And yeah, so anyways, it's like a real wow. So check it out. It's definitely one of those things to think about. Um, so a question... Uh, that constantly comes up is, isn't this just, and you did reference it, um, I think Terry, you reference it, isn't this just gonna happen on its own? And Alexis, you mentioned this a little bit, but like, can't we just relax and let all these girl power organizations and women's leaderships things do their do their thing? Like, is AI just gonna be fine if can't we just let it go? Can't the women solve the women problem already? <laughs> <laughs> like, isn't it just gonna be fine without us doing all of this work? No. no. How come? No is the short answer. Um, no, it, it won't be fine. I mean, unfortunately, it's going to be an extremely heavy lift. Um, I, you know, I think related to a lot of the issues that we've already discussed, and then when you think about the impacts that these workforce equity discrepancies have on the actual products that are being created and delivered to consumers every day, the picture gets even grimmer, right? So a big problem in the AI, in the AI field generally right now is just what we do about bias in AI systems yep. and how we implement them effectively without discriminating against uh, traditionally marginalized or underrepresented populations um, who ultimately are in the weaker position when it comes to being able to participate in the technology development process to begin with, as yeah. we've been talking about today. So I, I think it's really important, and it, it speaks directly to these issues. All these things are related to one another, mm -hmm. and it makes them all the more critical, and the problem is not going to solve itself. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think that the, you know, the burden... I think we should be incredibly grateful to the organizations with equity-focused missions out there. They're so crucial to the work. It would not be done without them. And the burden should be on all of us to contribute to this. Mm -hmm. It's really all of our mandate. Uh, it should be all of our missions to work this into you know, our top priorities as organizations. So I think that's, um, I think it's really important. Yeah, I think you're speaking to the right crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so the first year we did this study, one of the questions we wanted to answer was, how long will it take? Yeah. Right? So it was 2015. Uh, how long will it take to reach parity yeah. uh, in the C-suite? And I remember we like did the napkin math and came back and it was 100 years. And I was like, 
oh, that is really unfortunate. We'll not look to see that. So I said, you know, no, 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 we need a better model. Come on, we're McKinsey. Like, we can do this. Like, put more assumptions into that baby. Like, we can, we can fix this just with the numbers. So they come back, and I remember I was in my hometown of Chicago, and they call, and they're like, it's 300 years, it's 442, it's 600. And I was like, no, 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 stop, stop. Toss out the model, where is the napkin? Let's go back to 100 years, that is plenty. Um, but that was, our, that was our headline the first year, 100 years. And I thought, okay, I have three daughters. My sister-in-law is here, she has three daughters. Like, I do not want them, not only do I not want them to enter a workforce like this, I certainly don't want them to go through an entire career arc and discover at the end we are still mm -hmm. that far away. And this is why I think focusing on what the data tells you about where to go is so important. Because if you fix that first rung and you get those million women into management over the next five years, and you sustain that, and that's just equity. This isn't about imbalance, this is about balance. You sustain that balance, you can cut that number to nearly 20 years. Now that still means I'm gonna be pretty old. <laughs> But man, we would be, we would, every single one of us in this room would be there to see it. And I think that's the, the urgency, but also the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I agree. Quotas. <laughs> so th do you agree <laughs> with the quotas for women on boards, for example, and other, I mean, other quotas that people suggest at different points throughout the, throughout the company org tree, uh, the California legislation obviously put in the law about the boards. Um, is it helpful? Is it not? Does it cause people to dig in their heels more? Is it actually effective in the long term? Hmm. Well, so I actually, I'm not the data expert on this panel, so I'm going to refrain from, um, from again, from data driven analysis here, but I, uh, I do think that some sociological research has demonstrated that it does enhance this feeling of tokenism yeah. that exists that we talked about, othering uh, that people experience. And so it can be detrimental, actually, from the perspective of those who are the so-called beneficiaries mm -hmm. of such policies. But uh, that being said, if there's no other way, yeah, right? I mean... Uh, so I think it depends on the environment and the institution and the culture of the institution and the people involved in developing and implementing such a policy. Um, so it's it's really hard to say, but I, I will say that hiring benchmarks, I think, really work. Hmm. And it's not quite the same as a quota on a board of directors, but um, it is itself, a, you know, it's a goal, it's a target. Um, you, just like you would set KPIs or OKRs for yourself, you're making a performance metric for diversity and inclusion. And you have to do a lot more than hit those numbers. You actually have to create an environment that sustains talent and sponsors people effectively and supports them and facilitates a feeling of belonging, mm -hmm. um, which is also really hard to measure sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, the success of that. But I, I do think that measuring really, really matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we see that we see that in the data as well that, you know, companies that set goals or targets for themselves make more progress. And this, this just intuitively makes sense. Cause if you think about how you run every other aspect of business, I mean, you wouldn't say like, I need performance next year. Great. What do you need from me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just see what you do. I mean, no, you wouldn't, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't run a company that way. But then we get to diversity and because we're worried about quotas and tokenism and all these things are really important, but we say diversity is really important. Okay. It's a top priority now for over 90% of companies. That's excellent. Um, so what do we need to do? Like do what you can do, do your best. Well, this is my best. You already saw my best 100 years. Is that enough? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's not do more. How much more? Right. And if you don't put some sense of what the goal is, you give people no calibration of like how far, how fast do they have to run? Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer that when you put something out there, and it can't be like 50-50 by 2020 because it rhymes. Like it has to yeah. actually be, <laughs> number of times I heard that, that I was like, oh man, you know it's already 2018 or 19, right? <laughs> uh, that was a really poor choice of got like um, 29 Dr. days Seuss left or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it actually has to be rooted in where your starting point is. But then you can have an honest conversation that says, wow, that's going to be hard to get there. Boy, we'd have to do some things differently. Yeah. Maybe we start yeah. by figuring out, are we getting unintended outcomes already today where we're bringing in great talent, but we're not progressing them? And then we can honestly take a look at it and say, what else do we need to do? How do we need to be innovative or bold? But if you don't put anything out there 
what you get is I think what is a lot of what we've seen so far, which is incrementalism, right? right? And then you see movement at these flashpoints like the very top where it's extremely visible and where often when you have a leader leave, you can make big strategic moves, right? That you that don't require you to solve like the engineering of the whole company mm -hmm. uh, to operate in a different way. Yeah. So I think it's a really powerful, I think it's a powerful piece. And I think in this country, because of concern around things like quotas and the side effects, we, we over index then on, on setting no, no goals for ourselves. And we leave most people saying, I am committed, but I do not know what you want me to do to drive the change. And that's what we see in the data, even all the way through senior leaders. The vast majority of people say, I do not know the tactical things you want me to do to help make a difference. Mm -hmm. I also think, I, I'll pull out the really hard medicine for a do second. It. <laughs> Resourcing. I mean, it, not measuring goals implicitly comes along with no resources, right? So if you wanna, if you wanna help solve one of the most mission critical national challenges we've ever faced, you're gonna have to take time and money and talent to do it. And that's what we're facing right now. And so unless you really put success metrics against that, there's no way that organizations are going to be investing in this problem to the extent that they need to. Mm -hmm. Such a good point. True. I got a couple questions here. Where can we find the report? Get out your <laughs> digital computer device and <laughs> search up Lean In Women and the Workplace Report 2019. That will bring you right there. Um, Okay, so we talked a lot about diversity. There's also some questions here about the softer side, the inclusion and belonging side. So what can companies concretely do to create sort of cultures of belonging, those places where uh, the onlys are not the targets of all of this aggression and hazing and Me Too type stuff that's over prevalent in, uh, for onlys and for lots of other groups who are underrepresented in the workplace. Um, let's see. Yeah, what can, what can companies, what are the, the best practice companies doing? Yeah, so um, I think this is a big piece of the puzzle because what we see is that fairness and opportunity are the biggest drivers of employee satisfaction over time. And that's universally true across uh, employee groups. And the reason that matters is, you know, satisfied and engaged employees, they're more likely to stay and they're more likely to want to progress they're more likely to want to bring in more people like them mm -hmm. um, and see, th see others thrive. And when you get underneath that fairness and opportunity, there's some very specific things that people describe when they say, I see that opportunity. First, they say, when I look at who's hired and who's promoted, it looks like it's the right set of people. We reward the right set of things. I know what the things are that we reward, and I see it happening. So I see actually good outcomes in the choices we make as we progress people along. The second thing they say is just like good managers, good basic manager hygiene. This isn't about like really fancy stuff around gender or diversity or inclusion or special thing. It's like, you know, do managers give feedback? Do they listen to all voices? Do they have an open policy? Do they, they stamp out bad behavior when they see it in the moment to set the example? You know, do they advocate for others equally? It's all this stuff that's actually just about good behavior happening. And then the third one is this point about sponsorship mm -hmm. that we already talked about. And the reason these are so important is if you crack fairness and opportunity, which by the way, millennials and post-millennials care more about than anyone else. So it is sort of the future of talent is sits with, you know, this nut. If you crack that, everybody gets a better experience. This is no longer for women to succeed, men must not, for this group to get ahead, that one loses out on opportunity. It really becomes something where everybody starts describing a better environment. And I think that's the real power because I, I often worry we have framed this issue in like a very um, zero sum way. And actually when you look at the data and what people describe, I mean, 52% of men say, I don't see someone in leadership who reminds me of me, right? This isn't just a woman issue or an intersectionality mm -hmm. issue. It's actually an everyone yeah. talent issue. Yeah, I think those are all super reflections. I don't have too much more to add. Um, I mean, I think it's a really interesting insight that some of these interventions are actually much more basic and fundamental yeah. than we imagine them to be. And so while I think it's also extremely important to inclusion and belonging uh, and environments that facilitate them to, you know, 
do unconscious bias training and make sure that there's a huge centering of these issues from the top all the way through an organization. Um, I also think it's, you know, effective management, like you said, is, um, is a huge priority too. And it facilitates environments that make everyone feel like they're more effective and that they're cared for more and that they matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, it's really important not to forget those things. Right. And I suspect that's an easier pill to swallow for a lot of companies because um, beefing up management and making it sort of best practice seems easier for a lot of companies than um, ushering in a new wave of diversity and inclusion initiatives that they don't be, know how to think about. Right. They know they're already supposed to be doing good management and they are thinking about that. That's interesting. OK, so we have a we have a couple more questions. One. Um, is very concrete. It's from a young person, in, a young woman in tech who is wondering how to share accomplishments when she makes them uh, to her male boss to get a, a, acknowledged and compensated. So what would you say if someone came to you who was that person? Oh, man. I, uh, well, I think effective performance management is on that list of really basic, fundamental, mm -hmm. really important things. And yeah. so if there is not a system in place yet in your organization that facilitates a formal environment in which you can actually like describe what you've accomplished. Mm. I think that's, that's, you know, item number one. Um, and it's an excellent forum and why it's excellent is because it's an accountability center as well. You know, oftentimes your boss is not the only one seeing that. And so if you have concerns about recognition, then it's a great place to, uh, really demonstrate, I think, your accomplishments. But, I, you know, I think there's other sort of more cultural interventions that you can also use. Like, we have a Slack channel at the partnership called Hash We Did, we did That. <laughs> um, and it's a great place just for people to show off, honestly. And we've got, we have an amazing team doing all sorts of awesome stuff. And some of it is, is it's small and large and just having there be a cultural expectation mm -hmm. that you know, people shout from the rooftops when they do something or when they see somebody else do something, I think is really important too. And, and making that an acceptable practice and not stigmatized, no matter what gender you are, mm -hmm. I think is, is really important as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would build on that with three very specific things, which is first do it. Like don't, don't hold back, just toot your own horn because like the data shows that men consistently do this more than women. I mean, men will apply for a job description when they have 60% of the criteria met. Women will wait till they have 100. Yeah. Right, that alone, right? If you, if you take that lens to think about when you should um, share your accomplishments, you will just automatically be doing it less. Right. The second thing is I would make it more about a, oh, I'm not here to tell you about that, but because we have accomplished this great thing, mostly me, with you <laughs> as my venerable <laughs> supporter, you know, we should go think about how to take that somewhere else and share that <laughs> with other people. So it's about, I'm here to tell you about this in service to something that I think should happen. And oops, if you discover in the process the great work I did. Um, <laughs> That just happens sometimes. And then the third one is, you know, I spoke with a senior woman once and I love this story she shared, which is, she said, you know, I find it so hard to do for myself, but so easy to do for others. Mm. And so I just got together with the other senior women in our organization and we agreed anytime any one of us was having a conversation with any senior male leader, we would slip in like a great line about one of the other women. And we'd be like, oh, hey, how are you doing golf? Yeah. You know, did you see how Carolyn did that thing last week? Oh, you didn't. You should check it out. Right. And we just were like, I can't do it for myself. I, I just do not feel comfortable, but I can do it for you and you and you and you. I love that. That's a great one. <laughs> That's a really great one. And if you talk about the men in that way, you'll take them by surprise mm. and they might start doing it too. Love it. All right, so as you can see, it is two minutes before our official closure. So it's an informed tradition here to ask all of our speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Alexis, <laughs> either one can start. Did I just give it to you? No. Uh, okay, um, all right, I'm, I'm on uh, a kick for a karma bank. So I want us all to have a karma bank where every time you want to go out and 
tweet and tell somebody that they, you think something they're thinking about isn't a great idea, you have to first have shared some positivity into the world. Because I think it is far too easy around here, particularly when it's anonymous, to come down on what other people are trying to do. And I think we should actually celebrate and encourage a lot more of the helping people rise up. Mm -hmm. So that's mine, Karma Bank. That's a great <laughs> Well, I think that we did that channel is a great idea and every organization should institute it. Credit to our colleague B for suggesting that. Um, but in addition to that, I'll just say that they should make lavalier mics for women so you don't have to take your earrings off. I <laughs> agree! <laughs> Backstage. <laughs> it's not the Madonna mic if Madonna can't wear her earrings. I also agree. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis. And Tara for joining us here at Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I am Femily, the president of the American Association of Corporate Gender Strategists, and thank you so much for coming and joining with us tonight. Thank you.